I want to spend not only this Sunday, but the next few Sundays talking about the methods with which God heals us. Because when we, when we become aware of what he's doing, we're able to identify and, 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 and agree with him in it. We're, we're able to identify it. We're able to become aware. And once we become aware of something, we can identify it. But if we never become aware of anything, we can't ever identify it. Right? It's sort of, sort of like this. How many of you all have bought a car, and then once you bought that car, you see like a thousand of them? Right? You didn't see a thousand of them before. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get a car. Nobody, nobody's got that car. I'm like, be the, one of the few people who has that car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody's driving that car. Yeah, I'm going to be cool. And then you drive off the lot, and before you turn out of the auto dealer, you see a hundred pass you by. Like, everybody's got this car. I'm not special. Well, here's the reality. Those cars had always been on the road. You weren't aware of it. And now, because something has become personal, you've now become aware of it. And now you can actually identify. That's how it is with the Spirit of God and how God does things. Once we become aware of what he's doing and how he's doing it, we can actually draw from what he's doing, and it can be benefit to us. The Bible says that they perish because of a lack of knowledge. And, and this, this knowledge aspect of it has to do with our understanding of what and how he does things. And so what I want to do today and the next few Sundays is help make us aware of what he's doing and how he's doing it so that we can identify it and we can, we can move with him. We can align our hearts with him. Does that make sense? Uh, there, there are lots of reasons for why God does healing and miracles and signs and wonders. There's lots of reasons. Here are just a few. One, it represented that the kingdom had come to earth. And I showed that scripture to you a couple of weeks ago. It shows that Jesus was actually sent by the Father. It shows that Jesus came to destroy the works of the evil one. It shows his love for his people. And it confirms his word. These are just a few. There, there are others. These are just a few of the reasons as to why God heals. Now, there are a lot of denominations who believe that healing doesn't exist today. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's called, the, the theological term is cessationism. It ceased. It ceased with Jesus, the apostles, that went out. Well, it didn't go out. It's alive and well. You've heard testimonies this morning about it being alive and well. You've heard previous testimonies. It's alive and well. And I believe God wants to do more, but I think we have to be able to recognize what he's doing. Right? It, it would be like this. Let's say, let's say I had a, a hankering for fried chicken. Right? I have a desire for a fried chicken. And I was going to the buffet. Right? What am I looking for when I get into the buffet line? Fried chicken. I'm looking for fried chicken. I'm looking for fried chicken because I have an expectation, one, that it's available, and two, I can have it. So when we come, we have to have an expectation of one, it's available, and two, we can have it. If we don't have both of those in place, then chances are we're going to miss God. 
when it, in regards to our healing. We, we've got to believe that it's available and that I can have it. Let's start with Exodus 33. I can get this thing working this time. Exodus 33, verse 13. Reads this way. It says, if it is true that you look favorably upon me, this is Moses talking, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. If it's true that you look favorably upon me, Let me know your ways. Moses is saying, let me know how you are doing things. Show me how you're doing things. Let me know your ways. Help me to understand what's going on so that I may understand you. See, because as he is doing, as God is doing things, he's revealing part of his nature. This is why Jesus says to Andrew. uh, Andrew says, Lord, Lord, you are truly the son of God, uh, because, you saw, because, because you saw me when I was under the tree. And Jesus says, yeah, I'm, there's more that I'm going to show you. And then he says, show us the Father. And Jesus says to him, he says, what do you mean show you the Father? When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so what he was saying is because... I do and say everything that the Father is doing and saying. I am a full representation of the Father. Therefore, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so Moses is saying, show me your ways, because when you show me your ways and I understanding, I understand them, you are actually revealing to me who you are. And as we begin to understand more of God's ways, we begin to understand more of who he is. And then it goes on to say, um, so that I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. What's part of God's favor for us? Healing. That's a, that's a benefit for being in the kingdom of God. That's a favor. So I want to I enjoy more of your favor, and part of that favor is being healed by him. So this is what Moses is saying, show me your ways. The Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So there has to be in us this, this underlying expectation Faith it has in it sort of like, a, like, like in, the, in, the, in the cake mix, expectation. The Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. So therefore, we have to have a degree of expectation. Remember that video I showed you? And that, that woman says, I knew tonight was going to be my night. Her leg had been broken or whatever it was and a steel plate in it or whatever and she was being healed even as they as we watched the video she said I knew tonight was going to be my night she came with an expectation and we have to have in us an expectation not only when we come but anytime expectation is key in being able to draw from what God is doing So the first methodology that I want to look at is um, the Word of God. Let's look at Psalm 107, starting in verse 20. He sent out his word and healed them. He sent out his word and healed them. He sent out his word and healed him. Them. He sent out his word and healed them. Well, what word was it? 
I believe when the word of God is being preached, it doesn't matter what word it is. Because, because, because the word of God is living and breathing. So somebody can actually get healed right now as I'm preaching the word because the word is going forth. He sent out his word and healed them, snatching them from the door of death. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. He sent his word to heal them and snatch them from death. So one of the ways God uses, uh, demonstrates his healing is through his word. Here's the question, how well do we know his word? Can, can we actually stand on what he is saying to us via his word? I'm not going to turn to it for the sake of time, but Jesus says in um, John 6, 63, he says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. So whenever he speaks, the spirit of God is released. And what, do, what did we learn? Where the Spirit is, there is freedom. Freedom from what? Sickness, death, disease, whatever. Emotional distress, anxiety. Where there is the Spirit, there is freedom. So when Jesus speaks a word, we have access to what that word brings because the Spirit of God is accompanying the word of God. Matthew 8, 5 through 10. It says, When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed paralyzed and in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to come to have you come into my house, just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. So here is a Roman officer who's not even covenant through uh, Israel, didn't have covenant with Israel, through, through Israel with God, recognizing the authority of the word of God. And he tells Jesus, all you have to do is speak the word, and my servant will be healed. Just speak the word. So one of the things that we know is that the word of God can heal. Just speak the word. It's not our word, per se. It's his word that we speak. Right? It has to originate with him. We have, to, we have to believe it, we have to know it, and it has to be spoken to us by him, and then we say what he's saying. From that, we can, we can, we can uh, look at the this, this second methodology, which is authority. So he recognizes, he, the, the, the Roman officer, recognizes that Jesus has authority. Authority. Here's the thing about authority. Let's look at Matthew 28. Verse 18. This is the Great Commission. 
Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all my commands I have given them, given you. And be sure of this, I will be with you even to the end of the age. Jesus is saying, I have been given all authority. Authority has to be given. Throughout Jesus' time, the Pharisees kept asking, where did you get the authority to do this? And they assumed that it is coming from Satan. Where did you get this authority? Where did you get this authority? Where did this authority come from? Authority is given in the commission. When God commissioned Jesus to come to earth, he gave him authority. Anytime we've been sent... We have authority. So Jesus is sending his disciples. He says, therefore, now you go. So the authority that Jesus has, he's given, he's giving the authority to his disciples. Teach them what I taught you. When we became Christians, we were part of that. So now we have an authority that comes to us when we became Christians to do what he did, to learn what the disciples learned, and then to do what they did. But it, ha- it has to be given. I can't, I can't just, I just can't get my own authority. I, I can't go out in the middle of the street when there's an accident, get out of my car, dress like I'm dressed, and be like, stop, stop, stop. People are like, what are you doing? I can't do that. I don't have any authority. But a police officer dressed with a badge and a gun who has the authority can blow his or her whistle and say, stop. Because they've been given authority. I don't have that authority. We have to understand the authority that we've been given. Here's, here's the key to getting to understanding the, that the authority that we have and for the authority to grow. We have to be submitted to the mission. Jesus was. I, I have to be submitted to God's mission. When I'm submitted to God's mission, then I can come into co-mission. See? Jesus was submitted to God. Because he was submitted to God, he then became co-missioned to do what the mission called for him to do. Without the submission, there can't be co-mission. And a lot of times, we don't necessarily want to submit our lives to God. We we just want to do what we want to do, however we want to do them. But, but, But in order to really walk in our commission, the same way the disciples walked in their commission, we've got to submit our lives to him. So it's in the submitting that then we get commission. So, for example, Tony was a commissioned officer in the United States Army. First, she had to submit herself and go through weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of training. She didn't didn't get commissioned the first day she started her training. She had to submit herself to the training and go through the training. Once she went through the training, she got commissioned on behalf of the President of the United States. Then, she could do what she needed to do with authority as an officer in the United States Army. That's why why you have to salute her. Because she's been commissioned. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And so we get commissioned when we submit our lives 
to God, and we come in to commission. That's where the authority grows and grows and grows. So when Jesus speaks the word, it's because he carries the authority of heaven. Why? Because he submitted himself. The Bible says, um, let's see if I have this scripture. Yeah, Philippians. Let's turn to Philippians 2. I have it. Philippians 2, verse 5. It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. And the name of Jesus, every knee should bow every, in heaven and, and, and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. So, so Jesus submitted himself to God. When he submitted himself to God, God raised him up and commissioned him. So he carries with him authority. That's why the Roman officer could say, just say the word. We should be able to just say the word. We've got to walk, learn to walk in our authority. That means we have to be submitted to God. Okay. The laying on of hands is the third one, way in which you, you all are really familiar with that. For, for time's sake, I, I just won't go through that one, but you guys are pretty familiar with it. the laying on of hands. It's, it's when we put our hand on someone and, and, and pray for them. There is something that's transmitted through the laying on of hands. Throughout scripture. So, so, so you lay your hands on people and you pray and something actually is transmitted through you to that other person. It could be in healing. It, it, it could be in um, the, 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 the giving of a gift. It, it can be an acknowledgement of passing authority along. It, it, the laying on of hands can be used for uh, any number of reasons according to the Bible. But it is a way of imparta impartation, imparting to someone else what, what God has put in you to impart. That's, that's why when you ask me to pray, I'm like, okay, and I'll lay my hand on you. Not in every case. It doesn't have to happen in every case. But in some cases, I'll lay my hand on you. Okay? So it's the... It's, it's the impartation of the power of God working through one person to another person. This is why, you know, the Bible, the Bible says to not, not quench the spirit, right? Like you have a water hose that's flowing with water, and then you, 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 you uh, buckle the water hose and the water stops flowing. Well, we have to be vessels of the flowing of the Holy Spirit through us. So we've got to make sure that the pathway of the Holy Spirit working through us is clear. If we're all clogged up with all kind of junk, then the Holy Spirit won't work the way he wants to work through us. So, so we have to be a clear vessel for him to work through us so that when we lay our hands on someone, God actually can work through us to heal them. Okay, number four is medicine. God actually works through medicine to heal. 
About this time, Hezekiah, king, Hezekiah became deathly ill, and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to visit him. He gave the king this message. This is what the Lord says. Set your affairs in order, for you are going to die. That's kind of hard coming from God. Get your, get your affairs in order, you're going to die. You will not recover from this illness. When Hezekiah heard this, he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Remember, O Lord, how I have always been faithful to you and have served you single-mindedly, always doing what pleases you. Then he broke down and wept bitterly. But before Isaiah had left the middle courtyard, this message came to him from the Lord. Go back to Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Tell him, this is what the Lord says, the God of your ancestors, David says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you, and three days from now, you will get out of bed and go to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will rescue you and this city from the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my own honor and for your sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, make an ointment from figs. So Hezekiah's servants spread the ointment over the boil, and Hezekiah recovered. Meanwhile, Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What sign will the Lord give me to prove that he will heal me and that I will go to the temple of the Lord three days from now? Isaiah replied, This is the sign from the Lord to prove that he will do as he promised. Would you like the shadow on the sundial to go forward ten steps or backwards ten steps? The shadow always moves forward, Hezekiah said. So that would be easy. Make it go Ten steps backwards instead. So Isaiah, the prophet, asked the Lord to do this, and he caused the shadow to move ten steps backwards on the sundial of Ahaz. Interesting. So here is Hezekiah hearing from the Lord that he's going to die. Hezekiah begins to pray, oh, Lord, 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 heal me, heal me, heal me. God changes his mind, and he sends Isaiah back to him and says, nope, you're going to be healed, and I'm going to add 15 years to your life, but I'm going to heal you through this ointment. So his servants put this ointment on him, and three days later, he's healed. So God uses medicine to heal us. Using medicine is not a second class healing. Using medicine is not a second class healing. God uses medicine. He uses medicine. Not always. He doesn't always use it. Right. We, I'm going to read the story maybe next week, maybe the, the following weeks. You all know the story about the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years. The Bible said that she was going to the doctor for 12 years, gave them all of her money going to the doctor. She got worse after 12 years going to the doctor than when she started. So now she's broke and she's more sick. So it's, it's not always doctors that God uses, but in, in some cases, he does use doctors because medicine is God's servant. We don't, we don't put medicine above God. We say, God, you can use what you want to use. If you want to use medicine, go ahead. I'm looking to you for the healing, but you can use medicine, so I'm okay with with, with the medicine that the doctors give me because ultimately it's, it's you that healed me. You, you, you can use medicine or not. As you can imagine, I've been asked thousands of times about, about should, should, should you get vaccinated or not, Right? Should you, should, you, should you get vaccinated? And I've been asked that a thousand times. So the reason why I haven't talked about it, because I don't really care if you do or not. He, here's why. Here, here is what I care about. Listen to the Holy Spirit. I, 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 I showed you a scripture last week that said, 
because we live by the Spirit, walk in the Spirit in every part of our lives. Where there's a part of our lives that has to do with healing, has to do with uh, our well-being, has to do with our health. That's a part of our life. What is the Holy Spirit saying to us regarding our health? That's a part of our life. He wants to lead us in that. So whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you to do, you do. If he's, if he's not telling you to not do it, don't do it. But listen to the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what I care about in every part of your life. People are choosing to make decisions, and, and I hear this all the time. I, God, I wish I had a dollar for every time I heard this. God is going to protect me. I don't need to get a vaccination. Here's what I say to that when a person tells me that. Do you have brakes in your car? Why, if God is going to stop your car? Do you believe God is going to stop your car? Why do you have brakes in your car? Do you have locks on your doors? Why, if you think God is going to prevent somebody from breaking in your house? if you just leave your door open. It goes on and on and on and on and on because there is something that calls, we call common sense. There is something that's called common sense. So I'm not suggesting that because a person believes that, that they shouldn't honor that. I'm saying make sure it's the Holy Spirit telling you that and not presumption. If, if the Holy Spirit is saying, you don't need to be vaccinated, don't get vaccinated. If the Holy Spirit is saying, get vaccinated, get vaccinated. But let it be the Holy Spirit. Don't let it be presumption. God, because God, wait, wait a minute. Do we think God can work through a vaccination? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we think God can work without a vaccination? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, so the key is, what is God saying to you about this? Because he works through medicine. We, we, we can't ever say, no, he's not going to work through medicine. We can't ever say that. Nor can we say, he's always going to work through medicine. He may not. So every time we've got to go to God and we have to say, okay, Lord, what are you saying to me about this? Tony had an issue with her eye where the doctor thought it was pink eye, gave her some drops. Well, she went to her urgent care. Doc said, oh, this is pink eye. Well, but I need to send you to a specialist because I'm not a specialist. She goes to the specialist. The specialist says, you don't have pink eye. You got something else, but I just don't know what it is. Here, take these drops. The drops that the urgent care doctor gave her was different than the drops that he gave her. All along, I'm like, oh, okay, have no problem going to the doctor. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's, 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 let's ask the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit can do. So we prayed. We took communion, which I'm going to talk about probably next week. Her eye actually starts to get better. She goes to the specialist again and said, yeah, you know, the drops that they were giving you, mm, I don't know if those were the right drops or the wrong drops. Here's some, here's some other drops. Oh, okay. But listen, my faith was never in the drops. Her faith was never in the drops. Our faith is in the power of God and the laying on of hands and trusting God. God, even though the doctors don't really understand what's going on with this eye, we know you can heal her. So, her eye is significantly better. 
and probably will ultimately be healed in the next few days. But you could see the Lord working it out. Sometimes it doesn't happen instantly. Sometimes it does. Here, in this case, where I showed you, it took three days. I I'm making a case for medicine, but I'm making a bigger case to make sure you're trusting God while you're taking the medication. Don't, don't, don't make it about politics. Make, make it about God. Right? Listen, I know, I know a lot of Christians who think God is Republican or Democrat. He, they do. No, God is a Republican. And, or God is a Democrat. No, no, no. He's an independent. He's God. He, he's God. And, and he's not bound by a political viewpoint. Don't, don't, don't lower our understanding of God to something so small like a political view. Come on. God is so much bigger than that. So I'm saying, what is God telling you to do? Do that. And, 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 and when you ask me, what do you think? I'm like, what did God tell you to do? That's what I'm going to tell. I'm going to ask, what did God tell you to do? That's what you do. You, you see how we don't get stuck in a, a view, an ideology. Our ideology should be following what the Holy Spirit told us to do. Because here's the thing. He, he may tell me to do something one way, and he may tell you to do something another way. This is why every time Jesus healed, he healed in a different way. So we can't make a law out of this is the way Jesus did it, and this is the way we're only going to do it. What Jesus did do is he walked by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what are you doing and how are you doing it? That's the way I'm going to do it. So we can't ever box God into something. He can show us something. We can learn something. But we always have to be open. Our hearts have to be open to God. Show us via your Holy Spirit what you want us to do. We're, we're always safe in that harbor. Expectation. Knowing how God wants to move among us. Let's stand.